I first heard about knowing God in a real and personal way, it sounded suspicious to me. I'd grown up in a family where my mom was a very quiet Christian. She took us to church, but nothing was talked about. My dad was an angry agnostic, which meant talking to him about God was a dangerous uh, activity. My early church life as a young teenager, I felt like I belonged to my church. They knew the gospel, I heard it all the time, but no one talked about walking with God in a real and personal way. And then I went to Bible college. And what I was taught is that the word experience was a dirty word. It was suspect. So then I'm on in my life and it's full of experiences and some of them are really difficult. And one day I heard someone talk about knowing God like it should be real and personal. It was like a double hit because partly it felt like that couldn't be right. Everything I'd learned said otherwise, but partly it sounded like what I'd been reading and seeing in God's word. Everything was real and God was always relating to his people personally. So why not for me? And I'm not talking about going where, Chris, where scripture doesn't go. I'm talking about discovering that I just didn't learn this stuff. One of the passages that really impacted me, and I would say, I don't know, 25 or more years ago, was the one I came to this morning in Mark chapter three. It's where Jesus is appointing the 12 apostles. And I just want to read the part that touches on what it means to know God in a real and personal way. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those he desired. And they came to him and he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. Did you catch the real and personal part of that? Jesus had a desire for these particular men. They're the ones he wanted. Do you see Jesus that way? Having real and personal feelings about us? The Bible's full of that very full of, of communicating that God's love is real and personal. But the purpose stated for why Jesus called these 12 men at that time was uh, that they might be with him. I'm serious. That was mind blowing to me to picture Jesus wanting these men to be with him. Now, when we look at how do, we, how do we apply things that specifically related to, related to the apostles to ourselves today? Because we're not apostles. There are no apostles today. The apostles laid the foundation for the church. All Christians today are being built on that foundation. Peter called us living stones. We are the stones God is using to build a spiritual house, a holy temple, the church. So we're all part of that. Can we say that Jesus wants us to be with him? Is that for us? Well, what did the prophet say Jesus would be called Emmanuel. And what did Matthew tell us was the meaning of the word Emmanuel? God with us. Jesus was the word. He was with God and he was God. The word became flesh 
to dwell among us. Everything about Jesus' first coming was communicating his desire to be with us and his longing for us to be with him. That's why when he told the three parables in Luke 15 about the, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, it was to show the joy of God in heaven over every sinner who repents. Why? Because they want us to be with them. This is serious business and it can be transforming so that instead of thinking, I'm just gonna sit down and have my devotions, we start thinking, I'm going to meet with God and listen to his words. By the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. That was Jesus telling his church that he would be with us. That's why Paul would tell us to be filled with the Spirit. Because Jesus wants to be with us and he wants us to be with him. The picture of the curtain of the temple that was torn in two from top to bottom the moment Jesus died was to tell us God wants us to be with him. That's what's so fascinating. He even talked about when we believe in him and we abide in him, both he and the Father make their home with us. Isn't that fascinating? I could go on and on, but it's actually a cold morning and my hand is freezing. But I know you get the point. My testimony is that ever since I started relating to God's word, like God wants me to know him in a real and personal way, I have experienced God speaking through the scriptures so that every day it felt like exactly what I needed. When I was going through some of the most painful experiences of my life, I kept reading the word every day. And while the events were serious and grievous, and often left me bawling because of how painful it was for me, but also for, for people in my life. And yet I kept being comforted by the real and personal way that God would speak through his word. And I'll tell you about one. I grew up in Sanspit on the Queen Charlotte Islands, which is now the Haida Gwaii. And in 1997 was the first time I got to go home, my only time. And that was like 29 and a half years after we moved. And one day I was sitting on the dock that was right across from where we had lived. And I could see our house. I had so many memories about that wharf and us going there. And here I was sitting with my Bible open. And I came to one of the Psalms, somewhere in the 120s, I believe. And I read a scripture that said, the scepter of the wicked shall not remain over the land allotted to the righteous. Otherwise, the righteous may turn their hands to do evil. I was going through things, other people in my life were going through things where I could say the scepter of the wicked of the evil one had done a lot of damage. And there I was, all alone. The most surreal thing for me, to revisit my childhood home. And that's what God told me through his word. The scepter of the wicked, the, the rule of the wicked, would not remain over the land allotted to the righteous. Otherwise the righteous would turn their hands to do evil. 
And it, it was like God was saying, Monty, trust in me here. This is on me. That I have given you and yours something in my son. And I will not let the evil one have strongholds. I will not let him hold on to ground that has been surrendered to him because then my people might fall into such despair and discouragement that they would do evil and God would not allow that. Jesus came into the world to destroy the works of the devil. All I'm telling you is that's one of gazillions of examples of how the word of God speaks to us in real and personal ways. And reading again that Jesus chose 12 men to be with him reminds me of how he wants us to be with him. But not like apostles. Each of us who believes in Jesus Christ is a member of the body of Christ and Jesus wants us to be with him, abiding in him like a branch in the vine, so we will bear much fruit as we use our spiritual gifts to serve one another. That's what the apostles did. They, they were given something apostolic to use for building up the church. They did that. The foundation of the church has been laid. Now we are the living stones who live in a real and personal relationship with God, and we keep fulfilling our assignments, just the way they did, in the hope that you or someone else will discover that we can know God in a real and personal way.